Let's try a different Bible verse to start this morning. I'll start and you finish. Mind out. <laughs> oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. So we're here to enjoy the mercies of the Lord today, and I want to welcome all of you, especially our guests, because welcoming folks is just a great privilege. I talked to a couple of the folks who they came from God's country up in Michigan. <laughs> and so we were sharing stories. And, and, and getting God's people together from all over the country is really a beautiful thing. And so one of the things we'd like to do is invite everybody to fill out an attendance card, whether you're a member for 97 years when the congregation was founded or whether it's your first Sunday visiting, you can fill this out and drop it in the offering plate when offerings are received. And we're going to have a great time talking about being caretakers of God's earth. So, with all that in mind, we're ready, Josh. Good morning, and welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. It is a beautiful, if not a bit toasty day, and it is a wonderful day to be celebrating God's grace. In addition to the attendance cards, there are also little yellow cards, they're prayer cards, in the pew in front of you. And if you would like to fill them out this morning, they'll be gathered on the third song. But, for now, as we begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I invite you to stand and sing with us. Oh uh -huh. 
And as we continue singing to our Lord today, you may be seated. This morning, we invite our scripture reader to come forward. And we're doing a little change in <laughs> order of the readings. No, just keep coming, keep coming. <laughs> just want to make sure we don't mess you up as you read, because that marvelous picture that we just heard about, sang about, of Revelation, the second reading, the epistle reading from Revelation 21, let's start with that, because okay. it makes it real for us. The epistle from, is from Revelation of St. John, chapter 21. Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth. 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as, they, as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, and be the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Don't go away, but we're going to wait with that second reading for just a minute because, it, it, as many of you know, that glorious picture of what it's going to be like to be with the Lord in heaven sustains us when we've lost a loved one. And good chance for me to mention that uh, one of our fellow Altar Guild members, Noreen Engberg, uh, emailed yesterday. She's, she's living up in Wisconsin now and because of her mom. But mom passed away. And it's a celebration because we know where mom is going. And Clay is telling us in prayers in the early service a situation of loss of life and and this is what gives us hope right we got this glorious picture of what it's going to be like no more death no more crying no more tears and you've been through death in, in recent months and yet it's a celebration of of homecoming so what i'm going to ask you to do is just bow your heads with me and talk to god about how we trust and how sometimes our trust grows thin heavenly father you, you made this glorious creation you sang about a god of wonders far-flung galaxies and and then we mess it up. And we go through life and, and realize we haven't always cared for your earth the way you intended it to be. And, and, and because that happened in, to Adam and Eve long ago, we, we know that the punishment for our sin is death. And yet you've done this amazing turnaround. You've, you've said that I'm turning death into the gateway of escape from a sinful world into a perfect life in heaven. And, and that's what, what we've been singing about and hearing about in Revelation 21. And, and so our confession, Lord Jesus, is simply that we don't always see it clearly. We don't always trust it as deeply as, as you want us to. And so what we're asking in our confession is that you'll take away any seed of doubt, any desire to live life for ourselves and not for you. I confess the times that, that we've gone astray and done it our own way. And we ask you to, to come back into our hearts and lives, assuring us that the past is forgiven and the future is promised. And you're going to make it real because you, Jesus, are our Savior and the Father who sent you is the Lord of all creation. And so give us that deep down assurance this morning. Our sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So sharing the peace that comes from Christ would be a great thing to do right now. It'll give us a chance to meet our guests, too. So go for it, stand up, and, and do some getting reacquainted, and we'll come back to our readings in a minute. explain uh, while we're sitting down when you've just talked to each other just being reminded of, of what we're all about as a congregation and doing some announcements is uh, 
It's a timely thing to do. Some of you, you bumped into one of these cards as you sat down in your pew. You, you don't need to have one today. A lot of you have received the commitment cards in the mail already and the official ones coming this week. <coughs> Bridge to the future. I think we've talked enough about it that, that you know the campus revitalization projects that we just need to do a lot of fixing up around here. So I don't want to belabor that point at all, but here's why we do that kind of stuff. So there's this, this wonderful CDC it is part of the New Century Center. And yesterday we had, I think it was 25 folks. Dan, is that about the right count? From the Lutheran Church Extension Fund Board National Level. And so these folks are from all over the country. And when they get together for a meeting, they like to go to a place where one of the projects they've helped fund is, is being uh, played out in front of their eyes. And so we had the eyes of the people who have helped us with the financing for this, this huge and blessed project on our campus. And you just see the joy in their eyes as they looked at the facilities, saw the kind of ministry that they could envision in those classrooms, 16 of them over there. But for me personally, the high point of the day was when we sat here together in the sanctuary and got to tell them that at this point, nine of our students are planning to be baptized and we're talking to another family, it might be 10, and that's really what it's all about, right? People knowing Jesus, being welcomed into his family. So, yeah, we'd love to have you show up for chapel, either the 8.30 chapel or the 9.30 chapel this Wednesday, but, but even if not, it's going to be a celebration. It's going to be party time. And then the celebration continues. Spring festival, it used to be like silent auction, but it's enlarged to include a, a whole bunch of other activities, and it's at 5.30 on Friday because that works for these 275 CDC families that pick up kids. And so we're inviting you to come back and, and have some interchange with all of them. And before, yeah, all those great kids, before I finish with Spring Day Festival, I found out one more thing. There's a dunk tank. <laughs> and I'm it. <laughs> so I promise that there will be a big splash sometime on Friday night. Anyway, this, this is, uh, so, so some of you pay attention to things like this Earth Day, this past Friday. So what are our kids doing? They're thinking about this thing of this God of wonders who made this magnificent world, and they planted some seeds with a little help from Mike Hoffman and their teachers a, a, a few weeks back, and, and those, they germinated, and so there's these little sprouting things, and, and now, I, well, you can tell where that would be, right over there alongside of the, the CDC building, and, and they're planting them. And Monday morning, I get to come by, and God, please let them grow. <laughs> <laughs> Bless the kids who are, are being gardeners, caretakers of God's creation. So, uh, yeah, a lot of neat stuff happening. And, and I thought all of that would be good to hear before we get to the... So, Patty, come on up while I'm, I'm introducing this. The theme of the day is, is how God is bringing creation back together again. And Acts 11 is, is a section that helps us start to see it as the Gentiles, not just the Jewish people, are now welcomed into God's family. Great story. So, Patty, have that. The first reading for the fifth Sunday of Easter from, is from Acts chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brothers who were thought throughout Judea heard the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began to explain it in, to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision something like a great sheet descending, being let down from the heavens by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, eat and kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, not do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to be from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. 
And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, and you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as, uh, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized us with water, but you will, baptize with, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, uh, the, who was I that I could, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they, gave glorify, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that, life, that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Could you just bring that slide back up for, for a second, if you don't mind doing that? Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted life. God is working this thing of bringing people from diverse backgrounds together through Jesus Christ. And our gospel lesson will lead us into exactly how the glue will be distributed that holds us together. Long, long introduction before our, our third song, but the third song is, is right on target as to what this gospel lesson says for us today. So uh, out of respect for the words of the Lord, let's stand for the reading of John 13, verses 31 to 35. But when Jesus had gone out, he said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while, I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I, I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The love comes from Jesus, and let's sing about it right now. Can we stay standing while we do this? Absolutely. Okay. And during this next song, the elders will come about to gather up prayer requests.
risen and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes if grace is an ocean we're all seeing direction, take care of God's world. The week didn't work out for me to be able to get PowerPoint slides, so that's the only one you get for the sermon. The three-part outline is, is in the uh, worship folder if you happen to pick that up, but here's how the pieces fit together. Revelation 21 told us how it's all going to end, right? Well, the end is the beginning in eternity with God in heaven, the glory of, of all of that but it's the restoration of what God originally intended when he made this magnificent universe and he started filling planet Earth up. And that's what we're going to read about for a moment right now. If you want to be following along, you've got to dig out your Bible and go to Genesis, very first chapter in the Bible, verses 27 and 28, where God made sure that Moses got it written down that God created human beings. And he blessed them. And he said, have many kids. <laughs> okay, be fruitful and multiply. Have many children. So that your descendants will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. I'm putting you in charge of the fish, the birds, all the wild animals. It's a great story. I'm putting you in charge. Bring the earth under your control. A pretty strong words. It almost sounds like we own the place, right? But you know the bigger picture. God's the creator. We confess it over and over again. I believe in God, creator of the universe. He's the one who wrote my job description and yours. What's your job description? Caretaker of God's world. Take care of my world. And so Friday was Earth Day. Not a bad thing for Christians to celebrate, right? Because it focuses on our original job description. We've been put here to fill it up with people and take care of this creation. And see, seeing those kids get that message early on, what a wonderful thing. Church people sometimes get focused only on heavenly things. And it's good that we focus on Revelation 21 and how great it's going to be. That's, that's where it all leads to. But while we're here, we've been assigned responsibility to take care of planet Earth, and sometimes 
as a congregation, well, I don't know about Trinity, I haven't been here long enough, but sometimes I see congregations that the only thing we're going to do is preach the gospel. Yeah, but we got a prior assignment. Take care of my world. So can we push that off on Greenpeace? <laughs> or climate scientists? Or the SPCA, you know, protect the animals, or the EPA, well, probably not so much, but somebody other than me, take care of the earth for me. No, we can't run from that one because from day six of creation, God said, you guys, all of you that I've made, take care of this earth. So if I'm going to go do a, a decent job of teaching on stewardship in the church, I have to remind me and you, number one on the outline, that we are here to carry out the owner's wishes. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father said, take care of my creation, I'm putting you in charge. And, and you can picture how that plays out. Adam and Eve, <laughs> you're zookeepers for the, for the biggest zoo in the whole world, <laughs> a garden of Eden. Take care of the animals. Noah, you got to shrink that zoo down into the size of one ark. Right? Take care of my creation. So, that means that we're in good company when we get on board with save the whale or protect the live oaks in Orlando or don't drain the Everglades or if any of you are like me as a kid on one of those rainy days when, when the earthworms were just squiggling all over the, the sidewalk when you came outside, I'd rather pick one up and throw it back on the grass than step on it. Okay, quick poll. How many of you would pick it up? How many of you would just avoid it, but <laughs> wouldn't step on it? Okay. So it, it runs through our whole life, right? To take the job assignment, being caretaker of God's creation. And the second point this morning is simply that <clears throat> when we start thinking about how this works, sin always complicates matters. Somebody wants to steal, well, reappropriate the ivory tusks of elephants, right? Selfishly. Somebody wants to cut down the rainforest without thinking. Thank God we get to see the bald eagles flying and, and, and more and more of them. But all that's about carrying out the owner's wishes. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. That's the, the, the King James translation. And have dominion over it. Original job description for every one of us as children of God the Creator. <laughs> Of course, that raises all these, these great questions that come up in confirmation class. <clears throat> Probably every five years, <clears throat> somebody would, when we're talking about creation and Adam and Eve, would say, so I've been thinking about this. Adam and Eve had kids. Did that mean that they had to, like, marry each other? And you look at the Bible and there's no other explanation given. It wouldn't be so bad because this whole thing of we worry about mutations of interbreed, inbreeding and all of that. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. So anyway, you start asking questions like that. My favorite question, of course, is when somebody says to me, these the kids that want to stump the pastor or get us off track, so did Adam have a belly button? Isn't that a fun question? <laughs> He didn't need an umbilical cord, right? He was created directly by God. So when you get to heaven, <laughs> no, let's not even go there. <laughs> yeah. Adam and Eve seemed committed to carrying out God's job description, right? They talked to him every day in the garden. They were having a great time until the snake comes along and stirs up self-centeredness. And the whole story of the Bible is we've inherited this history of defying the owner's wishes and, and abusing planet Earth. And what does all that have to do with the stewardship program? A, a lot. And, and I'm hoping I can tie it together in the next 10 minutes or so. Because that second point I mentioned, recognizing how sin complicates matters, is the explanation why we've got to have a stewardship program and why it's so 
stressful in congregational life to actually do a stewardship program. So let me give you an example of why we have to have one. Abusing the earth happens all over the place, anywhere from, <laughs> I checked this out with a six o'clock service last night. Did you ever see anybody refuse to replace a divot on a golf course? Oh no. <laughs> Did you ever walk a golf course? <laughs> Somebody doesn't replace the divots. Well, that's a teeny little thing, but then you go to West Virginia or Pennsylvania and you find the results of strip mining coal operations and somebody didn't really think in advance. Dumping toxic chemicals, last example, up in the, the Flint River. My kids, some of them live right 40 miles north, or uh, the Flint River is 40 miles north of where they live. Abusing the earth. Sometimes it's taking care of the earth, but for selfish purposes, like, in Ohio, big, big uh, rejuvenation going on because there's an oil, in, well, until the price of oil went down, the investments in, in uh, fracking to pull oil out of shale, which could be using God's resources, but if you don't think carefully about what shooting all that stuff down, a mile down into the earth might cause a mile in either direction, it could be very selfish use of God's natural resources. Florida's an agrarian state. I don't know if you see the same problem here, but up in the Midwest, we heard many times about cattle and hogs being raised on chemically enhanced foods. And these teeny little prison-like cages it doesn't sound like honoring the owner's wishes, does it? And of course, the huge implications of genome research. Any of you into to paying attention to, to that whole thing, genome research, genetics, and the potential for helping people get cured from genetic anomalies? Tremendous. But you know, as well as I do, every time we discover something new about how God's world works, somebody's going to use it for good and somebody's going to use it for... And so it's scary to think about designer babies instead of in the image of God as, as God designed the world to work. You be fruitful and multiply. I'll help you raise the kids that come out of your reproductive activity. And, and where I'm going with this, it doesn't take long to see how deeply spiritual these issues of taking care of the earth really are. Taking care of God's world, God's way, when selfishness and sin are always lurking in the shadows every step of progress that we make in caring for God's world. And just to make this real for you, every single day we're confronted with examples of how people from all walks of life manage the gifts that God has given them for better sometimes, for worse sometimes. Sports stars. <laughs> Think of all kinds of examples, right? Entertainers. I confess, I, w I didn't ever follow Prince. <laughs> but he died too young. How did he use the gifts God gave him? Some of you can think about that. Financiers or brokers. Leaders of, of great big companies, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, what, what's Mark Zuckerberg saying, Facebook and all of that. Professionals, doctors, lawyers, pastors using the gifts God gave us the way God wants them used. Nobody's immune is the point, right? And sin always complicates matters, and so the issue is, are we stewards of the gifts God gives us the way God wants us to use them? Ultimately, the question when we do a, a stewardship program in the church is, who calls the shots? Who decides what's the best way to use what we've been given? Who runs the show? God or me? Now, here's the fascinating part of this connection to Trinity's current stewardship emphasis. So we're all about, as a congregation, using, in the best way we can, all the resources that God has entrusted to us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. That is the heart of our mission, making disciples of all nations, preaching the gospel. Why? Okay, Jesus said so. But why did Jesus say that? because he knew that's the way to get reconnected to God. But why do we need to get reconnected to God? Because we chose, all the way back to Adam and Eve, to not do it God's way. And so the ultimate issue is, who calls the shots, right? Who runs the show? 
And when people stray, like Adam and every descendant after them has, God has this great plan in place. Jesus, go down there. Start bringing people back together. Now, the, the one piece that, that ties some things together is why I wanted to hear Acts 11 emphasized. So, do you remember when it was, right after creation, that God's plan of dispersing people all over the earth to, to bring it under their control, to have dominion, when a group of people tried to stop that plan? Remember the Tower of Babel? Let's build a tower up to heaven so we can do it our way. God says, your puny little tower down there means nothing to me. I'm stopping this in its tracks. I'm making you speak different languages. Your engineers can't talk to your construction workers. Simple as that, right? People disperse. When does God start bringing people back together again? Do you know the story of Pentecost? Bunch of disciples, tongues of fire, speaking in their language, but people are hearing them in their language from all over the Jewish world at that time. And God's saying, by my spirit, we can start communicating again. That's why that Acts 11 reading is so cool, because it's saying it's not just for Jewish people coming back together, it's Gentiles that I'm welcoming into the kingdom of God. Who does God want in heaven eventually? Every single living creature. So why does Jesus have to come? God, people, back together again. So why do we have to have a stewardship program? So that the resources that God has entrusted to all of us can be amassed in a way that God's original plan to make us caretakers of the world, that sin in our lives as well as everybody else's messed up, can be fixed by Jesus Christ. So we preach Jesus not just because Jesus told us to, but because we're in this process of relationship rebuilding. The irony. <laughs> and, and just think about this for a second. It's the irony of I all ironies that the very problem that Jesus came to fix, overcoming selfishness and sin, is what keeps us from fully investing in the mission of Jesus Christ at Trinity. I don't know, it's Sunday morning, whether that's going to sink in, but... <laughs> Isn't that weird? That the very thing that Jesus came to fix that we live for as a congregation, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, gets inhibited by selfishness and sin in our hearts and lives. So God has, to summarize, God has this perfect solution for this huge problem of people who refuse to manage God's world God's way. And his name is Jesus. He forgives our sins when we confess and he fills our hearts with generosity. I just love that picture, oceans of grace. And if I'm sinking, that's what I want to be sinking in, right? You know? Oceans of grace. And, and out of that, we just thank you, Jesus, for what you've given me. Love one another? Yeah, because you love me, in John chapter 13. And yet, you know this, this as well as I do. I, I haven't checked Trinities exactly, but... But all across the nation, in Christian churches, the, the average giving is 2 to 3 percent of income. It, it, it's almost laughable, the irony of ironies, that the thing that stops the church from doing what Jesus called his church to do is exactly the problem Jesus came to solve, right? Sin. And, and the way it stops us from running the earth the way God intended for us to run the earth. And so this magnificent picture in Revelation 21 of paradise restored where there is no more sin, no more disease, no more death, no more crying, no more pain, all things new is only imagination for us. Apostle Paul got it at one point, Philippians 3.10, he says... You know, I consider all these things garbage compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. It's all garbage. We need to hear that as, as Americans more maybe than some third world countries because sometimes it's our things, our, our standard of living so precious to us that somehow subtly becomes more important than God's solution. Run the earth the way I told you to run it. 
Jesus is coming to help us start doing that better. And, and that's why when you take a look at, at your card, just the real thing's coming in the mail this week, so you can take one of these along if you want, but don't worry about it. Uh, you'll see it again in the mail. When we fill out a, a commitment card, the, the, the real issue is whether we will honor the owner's son, God's son, Jesus Christ. Three specific ways that I know I have to wrestle through it every time a stewardship program comes along. Will I honor the owner's son when he, Jesus, confronts my tendency towards selfishness by saying, and you know these words, seek first the kingdom of God. He's the owner. He runs the place. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, doing things the way he planned them to work. And what will happen if you do that? All these other things will be provided for you. So Carol and I are trying to figure out how's it going to work to take the belongings up in Cleveland and the belongings that, I don't think they're going to put them out in the street, but our, you know, our lease ends pretty soon here and God hasn't revealed the timing about the next pastor coming here. And So should we just like amass our little stuff? Okay, God, <laughs> seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things get sorted out for you. Some of you, over the years, have gotten to the point where there's absolutely no doubt in your mind, I'll do it God's way, let the chips fair fall where they may, right? Some of you have gotten to that point? I don't know how you're going to make it work, God, but I know you, and you will make it work. So first part, honor the, the owner's son when he confronts my selfishness. Second part, <clears throat> how do you honor the... The owner's son, when he confronts your selfishness, by confessing my sin and asking his forgiveness. That's part of the process of filling out a commitment card. Yeah, you need to take a look at your income and, and think about you know, how you disperse blessings. But, but ultimately, the spiritual issue is, as I think about all of this, and, and Jesus is knocking at the door of my heart, will I confess Nobody else can know this about you, so it's just you and, and the Lord. Will I confess my sin and ask his forgiveness? Because if you want to know how the mission of Jesus Christ can receive exactly as much support as God wants it to have here at Trinity, it depends on each one of us confessing our sinfulness, our selfishness. Wherever we know that we're not running God's world God's way, and we ask Jesus, Forgive me, and we promise Jesus, I'll do it your way. Of course, how many of you have made a promise to God and not kept it? And so the third part is asking Jesus to empower us to keep whatever promise he stirs us to make. And that's where Paul got it so right and helps us. He says, so it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. I can't do it on my own. I can confess that I'm not doing it. I can ask for forgiveness for not doing it. I can promise to do better, but ultimately, I won't run God's world God's way for him until Jesus lives inside of me. Let me ask, would that be a good thing if Jesus Christ was alive and well in every single person in this building? That'd be awesome. It'd be so cool. I'm not running my own life. Jesus is. So, to, to put, bring this all together, when comes time for you to do your card, some kind of prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I do want to honor you in how I manage what you've entrusted to me. So, Lord Jesus, please show me where any selfishness or sin is keeping me from taking care of the Father's world in the Father's way. And Jesus, please forgive me for selfishness that still shows up in my life so that I can make a promise to do things your way. But Jesus, I know that I won't even keep my promise unless, unless you empower me to keep that promise. Help me, Jesus, do things your way. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if we pray that prayer, and we all do what the Lord nudges us privately, individually to do. 
guess what? Trinity will be blessed in ways that you and I can hardly even imagine. So, let's stand and give him honor by asking him to cleanse our hearts. As we come together in this time of offering, one of the greatest things we can offer is simply our thanks. And so we invite you to sing with us as we offer that thanks to our Lord. Except this is the moment for Andrew to tell us about what God has been working in his heart, and he's got it written down on paper. So uh, let's make sure we got the microphone lined up at the right height for you there. T check your voice out, make sure it's coming through. Hello. Hi, I'm. Introduce Hello. yourself. Hi, I'm Andrew Horton. Okay, super. Now, now we know that it's coming through loud and clear. Enjoy sharing your faith with us. I was raised in a Christian home and I was taught at a very young age that the Bible was the ultimate truth of God. I was baptized, brought to church, and began to learn more about God as I grew older. Although I had a good start, I know this walk with the Lord is a lifelong journey. And it says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 33, walk in the way of the Lord, your, walk in the way of the Lord, your God has commanded you so that you so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will p possess. I began to realize in confirmation class how important my relationship with God is and how important it is to know that what he is trying to say to me every day. I know that I, I am made in his image and made for his glory. I am standing here today confirming what I have learned over the years and have come to believe in my heart what is to be true about my Lord and Savior. I believe God is a triune God. He is one God the Father, one Son, and one Holy Spirit, but all three in one divine being. I believe that God made me and all the earth, and that we are his creation. He provides me with food, water, shelter, and all other life essentials. He made this world by word alone. 
He wants the best for me and loves me more than human words can express. He is like an earthly father because he guides me with discipline and with love. I know I can trust him with everything. He is unchangeable, all-powerful, and eternal. Jesus Christ is God's only son. He is my Lord and Savior. He came down from heaven and lived as a human. He led a holy, he led a holy life and freed me because without him I am lost and condemned. He was crucified for me and for everyone. I am not afraid to die because I know I have eternal life in heaven because of what Jesus did for my soul. The third person of the Trinity is God the Holy Spirit. He brings me to faith in Christ so I can have redemption and lead a godly life. He helps me with my attitude and desires and helps me want to overcome sin and do good deeds. I believe that baptism is not just plain water. It is water combined with God's word. Bab with God's word. Baptism is water applied by immersing, washing, pouring, sprinkling, or any other way. The power of baptism in God's word with the water. It does not matter how much water or how it is applied. <coughs> baptism gives us forgiveness of sins and rescues us from death and the devil. Baptism is, only, is one of two holy sacrament, sacraments instituted by Jesus. In the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus commands us, Go therefore and make the disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Lord's Supper, which is also known as the Sacrament of the Altar, it is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, instituted by Christ himself for us as Christians to eat and drink. These words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, reminds us that he died for us and for our sins. Every time I take communion, I am reminded how much he loves me, and I am renewed and can go forth with the confidence that I am forgiven, loved, and can be at peace with this knowledge. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He came to us as a baby. He was a great teacher. He taught us the way, of, the way of God and showed us the right way to live. He was an ordinary man with extraordinary powers. Because he was man, he understands how we feel. He too has felt those things. He performed miracles such as raising the dead, making the blind see, turned water into wine, and fed 5,000 people with fish and loaves. All of these divine works show us that his, he is truly the Son of God and is, as well as true man. We are all sinners, but he has lived a sinless life to give us eternity. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. I love Jesus, and I am so thankful for what he has done for me. I believe in prayer. Prayer is speaking to God in words th and thoughts. Praying for him, or praying is a form of worship. We can use it to take to talk to God, to thank him, praise him, and ask for things we need prayer for, prayer and blessing for. When you ask him, or when you ask, you shall receive. In the Bible, it states, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 8, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the, do knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Prayer is my connection to God. I open my heart and express my feelings to him. This allows me to become closer to him and learn to communicate with him and hear his voice in return. I am thankful for my eternal life. When this earthly life is over, I will join the other believers who have passed on before me in heaven. I was dead in sin, and now through Jesus' life and crucifixion and the power of the Holy Spirit, which allows me to believe in him, I will go to heaven when I die. God loves me so much that he gave his only son for me, as it states in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This earthly life is very short compared to the life that we will, that we will be given for eternity. Human words cannot describe the joy and peace that we will be given in heaven. I am thankful for my family, my confirmation teachers, pastors, youth groups, and all of my Christian friends that have encouraged me along this part of my journey and have helped me along the way. I pray that I will continue to grow and learn more about Jesus Christ and will be able to share his love and compassion with others. Praise God for his goodness and gift of faith at work at Andrew. Some of you have known for a long time what I'm just having the privilege of starting to discover this year is that God has gifted this young man in amazing ways, and not just the ability to state with clarity what's in his heart, but to bring life into a group of people. 
You keep doing it, fella. God has plans for you. Let's stand now for a time of prayer. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for working faith in all of our lives, but especially this morning, we thank you for Andrew and for Faith, who stated her, Faith Finger, who stated her faith last night, and uh, Isaac, who will be professing his faith publicly at the 11 o'clock service. Thank you that faith grows where the Spirit is alive and well. Accept our gratitude, we pray, Lord Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we have some special petitions this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray for your healing powers for all of God's children, and especially for AJ. Grant him a speedy and complete recovery following surgery. And for Bill, continued healing of his brain tumor after encouraging news of the shrinkage of that tumor. And for Tricia, healing and recovery following a stroke. Dear God, restore her strength and her health. And for Clara, we pray grant her we pray that you grant her negative test results on her diagnostic tests. We pray for your blessings on Jeanette, who lost her home last night to fire. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that no one was injured. We ask for your spiritual guidance for Chris as he considers employment opportunities. And thank you, Father, for good biopsy results for Lance. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, there's so much else that we could bring to you in words, but this morning, we just want to gather all that's on our hearts and in our minds in the words that you taught us to say, Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name, thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us give this us day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass, 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 trespass against us. And lead us, lead us not us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Our Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the meal, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The meal of God for the people of God. You may be seated as we begin our history. Oh 
that you have come to us again, once again, in such a personal way to assure us that oceans of grace and mercy flood our lives and that you love us with an everlasting love. Now help us to go out of here, letting that love overflow into the lives of those we touch. In your name we pray. And we pass on the blessing that you give us from the Father Almighty. Let's stand together and extend a hand of blessing as we say together, the Lord bless you and keep you.
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. As we close, won't you please sing this with us? Peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.